for now, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Kim Fortune from the Science and Technology Studies Program at Rensselaer Polytechnic in New York. Um, Dr. Fortune, for those who don't know her, is an anthropologist whose uh, best known work is on environmental issues in industrial and post-industrial settings. And her groundbreaking book, Advocacy After Bhopal, paints a dizzying portrait of the complex and unruly political picture that emerged after the Union Carbide explosion in 1984. Since then, she's pushed anthropology to find new methods to think about the politics of science, environmental movements, health, and risk, but also find new and innovative forms of representation for anthropology and ways of articulating um, with other disciplines and other kinds of publics. She was co-editor of Cultural Anthropology for several years and is currently ed editing a new book series with Pennsylvania on critical studies in risk and disaster. I don't know if you have any titles yet. Not yet. Not yet. They're coming. So. Um, and for many of us who are grappling with how to understand the amazing social and material complexities of environmental problems, to give it a name, um, and how to engage and respond to them, Fortune is a model scholar, always pushing against simple answers at the same time as she strives to open up uh, new kinds of knowledge. So please join me in um, welcoming Dr. Fortune. Well, it's, a, uh, it's an honor to be here, and the workshop start this morning uh, certainly propelled us into a good discussion that you'll see I um, uh, was trying to kind of crowdsource what I was learning this morning as we went. Um, but what I'll speak to you about this afternoon is about a need for and practice of what I've come to think of as infrastructural analytics, tuned to the conditions, dynamics, injuries, and disavowals of late industrialism, a historical period that I locate as originating in the 1980s striving to capture the entangled states of neoliberalism, aging industrial infrastructure, oiler, oilier than ever corporate forms, soiled grounds, and contaminated communities, all more visible if not entirely legible because of new flows and ways of configuring information about these problems. And this slide points to one way I think about late industrialism, which is a time peppered with both fast disasters like the British Petroleum Deepwater Horizon disaster and slower disasters like the global asthma epidemic and the global um, crisis in amphibians. Uh, and of course, uh, corporations' participation in the way we understand these problems characterizes our engagement with them. So my aim here is to encourage you, speaking to you as cultural analysts, to intend to data infrastructure as a scale and object of investigation, and to be open to data analytics and what I've come to think of as collaborative hermeneutics as both method and politics. It's one way, I think, to new forms of scholarship, pedagogy, and world making that we desperately need. So I'll star start with a personal genealogy and description of some of my recent work to give you a sense of uh, the grounds from which my investments and arguments come. And then I'm going to turn to the papers that have come together for this workshop uh, to try and pull them into a space of collaboration. So my concern with late industrialism began and continues to be ethnographic. As was mentioned in my introduction, I began my research career at the site of the 1984 Union Carbide chemical plant disaster in Bhopal, India. I was not in the field in the immediate aftermath of the disaster but at the beginning of what would become the long durée and slow disaster six years later, as the Bhopal case was heard, yet not heard, by the Indian Supreme Court. Despite the gross injury and destruction wrought by the disaster, with up to 10,000 people killed and half a million people designated as exposed, the di disaster was difficult to account for. The out-of-court settlement is widely perceived as an injustice to gas leak survivors and is laying, lying soiled grounds for Indian futures. I've thus spent my career concerned with systems of accounting for disaster, fast and slow, and the many ways that regard and responsibility are deflected. The image of the crude information board that you see here, used to search for survivors of the Union Carbide gas leak, has haunted me, signaling a need for better technologies and tactics. I coupled the images from Bhopal with the images on the bottom, also from 1984, when Apple released the Macintosh personal computer, promising a new era of democracy enabled by information technologies and practices. 
The promise of these technologies have also been a recurrent concern for me, partly because I have lived for the over two decades in an interdisciplinary department of science and technology studies where I've been challenged to figure out how to adapt the signature methods and insights of cultural anthropology to the study of scientists, engineers, and the knowledge and technical systems that they build. My central focus as an ethnographer over the last decade or so has been on environmental health scientists wor working to make sense of toxic chemicals, particularly as carried by air pollution. If the figures you see at the bottom are the kinds of people and artifacts I work with, and they inspire the argument I'll make today about a need to work and think more collaboratively, linking diverse methods, data types, and knowledge for forms running after the promise of what is now termed data analytics, a new way of talking about old ambitions to think holistically, materially, and experimentally. Potentially, I think, a new way to take steps towards an ecology of mind, as Bateson once put it, or perhaps here, steps towards an ecology with infrastructure in mind. The path will be fraught and riven with absurd detours. A case in point, I just learned about new work on air pollution data by a computer scientist in Houston using analytic tools developed to understand shopping behavior to understand the possible cumulative effects of different pollutants on emergency room visits for asthma. Interestingly, her work was uh, prompted by the work of a philosopher, a continental ph philosopher of the kind many of us uh, are kin with. And so the collaborative production of a project that utilizes deviantly, as some put it, um, established analytic tools is of interest. So imagine the kind of analyst that, uh, analysis that tracks and predicts buying behavior. If a woman buys diapers, she also is likely to buy granola bars and organic shampoo and so on. The same data processing techniques are now being used to process thousands of data points with different kinds of air quality monitors spread across Houston uh, uh, monitoring different kinds of chemicals related then to emergency room visits for asthma. The point is to see if it matters when there are high levels of particular combinations of chemicals uh, on a, in, a, in a particular time span. And this kind of effort to capture cumulative effect has been uh, out ahead of the environmental health sciences for many, for many, many years. And I point to this example, too, just because of the unlikely partnerships that produce this kind of knowledge, but also of the way hermeneutic sensibility, a read of the world across scale that I think ethnographers are really well positioned to provide, uh, can feed into the production of these new, this new kind of knowledge. But this kind of analysis is not conclusive in a hegemonic sense. It's suggestive and good to think with. So figuring how, how to f move these new forms of knowledge into politics and policy and into everyday life is going to be a cultural challenge uh, among other kinds of challenges. Okay, I also say that I, uh, I've worked in S an STS department, but at the oldest engineering school in the United States, and that certainly um, structured the way uh, that I see the world today. This is the kind of infrastructure report card that my colleagues helped produce. This is the American Society of Chemical Engineers. And you'll, if you can see, we get a D or C or D on most areas of our infrastructure, including infrastructure, uh, basic infrastructure, uh, toxic infrastructure, and importantly, they're now judging our public schools. Our public schools get a D for built environment infrastructure. And as you'll see, I'll move through this. I see uh, educational infrastructure as part of the infrastructure we need to imagine in imagining environmental problems. One of the things that the way I've thought about where my work has gone is, as I've moved between anthropology and STS is to multiply the scales that come that I want to bring into view in, in observing the systems at hand. And so you'll see the kind of classic scales of the, uh, the micro, meso, and macro layered in with other scales. And I'll, I'll come back to this, but I just want to give you a sense of um, the cascade with uh, eco at the kind of classic bottom. But I've put the geopolitical and what would we might call the anthropocentric at the top, uh, thinking that it is not just a ground up kind of a phenomenon. And think about it, when we think about ecology, we rarely think about atmosphere, for example. 
Um, I'll point out that anthropologists were often likely to forget the meso, meso level. In STS, there's a, a tendency to forget the level of subject formation, so that's on here as the nano level. Um, and so I have the eco level. The data level is the level that I'll focus on here uh, and on up. And the, the image I used to think with, with is this is uh, the kind of rock that shale gas comes from. Uh, and so I, I use that to remind myself that these systems are vital, as many theorists have reminded us, but they're also toxically vital. They produce injury as well uh, as vitality. And so these are the questions that uh, shape my current um, book project, which I can't read on my screen, so I'll read from here. Uh, what legacies of industrial order, ecological, technological, political, discursive, and so on, shape and delimit contemporary conditions? And what harms, hazards, externalities, and disavowals are they, do they produce? And third, why is it so difficult to make environmental sense of contemporary conditions? What cultural formations work against this? And I'll, uh, with appreciation, say that all the papers for this workshop help address these questions. And I see this, uh, my project, as part of a longer, very long-standing critical project in, in cultural analysis to understand how injury is produced, recognized, legitimated, addressed, and disavowed. And so in trying to characterize late industrialism, I'm not reaching or even aspiring for um, a totalizing analysis of the contemporary. I've been asked, for example, if I have enough, uh, if all the finance studies in our field kind of per percolate through my work, not enough. And so this is just one take on the formations within we now operate. And this is an image that I often use to think with. This, this is schools on the fence line of a chemical plant in Houston. Houston has no zoning, so there's <coughs> high hazard uh, facilities right against uh, homes and fence lines. But a one way to think about this image is to say, how does it make sense to repeatedly, again and again, put schools in harm's way uh, in, in this way? And in the, in nearby in this community, a new high school was built just four years ago. So it's not just old infrastructure uh, that's reproducing uh, the problem. And one of the ways I've told myself uh, uh, or characterize for myself what the problem is, and is in terms of what I've thought of as language ideology. The very, very fundamental ways w that we think, we think of things as things and things as operating in the world. This is a convenient ad campaign by the American Chemistry Council, which is the trade organization for the American chemical industry. And it was built around the premise of industrial chemistry is essential to everything, essential to environment, to health. It was a good uh, ethnographic artifact for me because the uh, web presence of this ad campaign is dense, dense, dense with information, uh, but with no, no mention of risk and injury. So there was a you know, very, very productive disavowal uh, of the externalities of the system. But in my understanding, if you think about why is it that we protect the, the, the chemical plant and not worry about what crosses its boundaries? There is this very basic sense that what matters is inside those, it's in the productive unit inside those fence walls. And so trying, this is just one example of the kind of analysis I'm trying to kind of backward engineer to understand how things make sense that don't make sense. I'm now going to tell you about two uh, very recent little field trips I took of very different kinds that I think will give you uh, a sense of how I come to the argument that I'll try and enroll you in. This is the community of Manchester in Houston, Texas. Uh, there is a, a chemical plant just on the fence line in back of these homes. Uh, the rail lines here in front, uh, are it's about a nine way rail uh, passage here. There's oil trains coming in from the Bakken Shale as well as elsewhere in the country. So it really is a, a charged community situation. The plants line three sides of the community. Uh, the rail lines cross the fourth side. So even in everyday instances, they have trouble getting uh, ambulances and fire trucks in and out if there's a, um, a train sitting on the rail line. But what's particularly interesting today is that Manchester sits in the midst of 
emerging kind of political economic formations that are, that are very much at the heart uh, of the discussion in this workshop. So the trains are coming down uh, from the Bakken Shale, have added freight rail into uh, this area, which is on the port of Houston. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline would bring further uh, petrochemical products into it, and the port is expanding because of expansion of the Panama Canal. Um, so the community really is already boxed in and yet kind of uh, sitting literally at the midst of these um, uh, emerging formations. This is the kind of image I followed for a long time. This is this image viewed through the lens of Bhopal. Each of these red circles is, the is a facility with the potential for a worst case scenario like Bhopal sitting over Manchester. So the worst community, which is just a little bit um, uh, uh, down the bio from Manchester, there's 40 chemical plants that uh, sit around um, a, a, a given, the, this is organized around schools, done by the Center for Effective Governance. And what I want to point to with the series of images I'm going to show you now is the way that data analytics has given us different vantage points on communities that I think that uh, we, we can help produce and learn to move in, uh, into public dialogue. This is another kind of data uh, mashup. This is an image of the plants that had worker deaths in, the huge, in, in Texas that were actually investigated by uh, federal regulators. And so what you can back out from this is both the incidence of injury and the incidence of disregard for injury. <coughs> this is a, a more simple visualization, but I think points to the kind of comparison that we might be after as cultural analysts uh, in thinking a lot over the last few years about why we don't collaborate of cultural, uh, as cultural analysts, uh, why we don't, why we should. Uh, I think it's, it's, I've clarified my thinking about that there's good in the resistance to collaboration because there's such a resistance to entering into formulaic methods, which I think is a virtue of our field. On the other hand, if there's not a shared space, you're not collaborating. And so really thinking about what collaborative space is and what comparisons are. And so, for example, the, f the figure or the instance of the human studies area files where you're doing side-by-side, -side, uh, very literal comparisons, I think is not a kind of comparative practice that many contemporary cultural anthropologists would enter into. But if you look at this image and think, what do you get when you just lay Texas over France to get a sense of, like, comparison? It's a kind of one-off. It's hard to say what you get. But you get a sense of familiarity and difference that I think that we can call into our studies. Similarly, this is uh, the loop, the uh, highway around Houston, uh, laid over the Bay Area. So again, I, th I think a lot about transportation as an air pollution source. So these kinds of just um, comparisons that are good to think with uh, is both enabled by data analytics and brings something new into ethnographic practice. This is a data mashup that shows in Texas the communities that uh, don't speak English. And so you, s you can see nestlings of risk where access to, uh, you know, ac access to language and political space, how it clusters with uh, uh, proximity to technical risk. Uh, this one, which is hard to see, is a distribution. This is a kind of classic uh, uh, race and ethnic a diversity model for Houston, but you can see it clusters very, very parallel with the high-risk industry in Houston. And I'll point out that when GIS became available in the early 1990s, that's when you got the environmental justice movement. So literally the ability to see, envir see and pronounce publicly environmental justice as a problem, as a, uh, problem was um, related to informatics capacity. And this is just one of the, my last image, and this isn't very complicated uh, uh, technically, but points to the political purchase of these kind of images. Um, this funny looking line here is a gerrymandered district that Republicans in Texas, so you get all of the city of Austin and a Latino belt down into San, to San Antonio. And so the way that data visualizations can be, can, are used for political purpose, it's not can they be used. And again, I think there's a place at the table uh, for analysts 
uh, like in our community. And this is just a different kind of images. This is, this is a 1972 image of um, bus li uh, train lines in Houston that were never built. This is a 1942, 40s image of subway lines that were never built. And so the way that uh, data analytics can give us access to that which didn't happen is another way that it kind of can bring ethnography into politics. Okay, and I'm going to use this slide to segue into the second research uh, trip I took recently that, that I just want to speak briefly about to lay grounds. This is a, uh, it puts ozone data from all over the country. It just puts it on the ground on a map. And this was enabled by linked data, and what's often talked about is the semantic web. We have a big semantic web group at RPI where we work, and they have uh, brought me, me into, drawn me into, further into the effort to think about the kind of data analytics capacity that can serve um, us in the ethnographic community. And so this is the other field work I did just the week before I was in Manchester. And it was at the biannual meeting of the Research Data Alliance. And the communities at these meetings are not local grounded communities. They're communities, whole communities of people work on provenance, metadata, repositories, and they kind of each are in their own part of the woods. Uh, and I was there both observing their, them, partly because a, a cross-cutting theme of this conference was building infrastructure for the environmental sciences and earth sciences. Uh, but I was also there as what they call a domain group. I co-chair an interest group called the Digital Practices in History and Ethnography Group because I want to learn from these other groups what kinds of infrastructure can support collaborative practice uh, in our community. Th these are the kinds of communities that come into play. Digital Himalaya, some of y'all may know about. It's a portal to materials on uh, the Himalayan region, incredible um, array of artifacts that are, are artifacts and materials that are available to scholars around the world. This is, other people in our community are building tools. Uh, the ancient studies people are big in this world. People that have, people in museum studies who have experience building infrastructure to collect things are way out ahead of those of us who have just gone off to the field by ourselves. But the, plat the platforms I've been involved in are, uh, it started with a project called the Asthma Files, a big collaborative project to understand environmental health governance in different uh, places and in different scientific communities. Uh, that ported us into an effort to build digital infrastructure to support that collaboration. And the only things I want to say on this here is the image of the kaleidoscope has become very important to us. We're understanding that what we're trying to do is to bring different knowledge forms together in a way where you can kind of continually um, spin them and see the phenomena at hand in different ways. So this is the, the ethnographic project that has kind of guided the other project and grounded it. And one of the things we've learned that um, trying to get ethnographers to collaborate is um, worse than herding cats. And as I said earlier, largely for good reasons. Uh, but we've, we've learned to think in terms of what we call light structure, which is structure that would um, create a space of shared play without overdeterminations. And I've thought a lot about the work of Winnicott and the way children play. If with just a little bit of structure, they play uh, more differently than with no structure at all. And so bringing those understandings of the way kind of meaning gets made and delimited into the building of digital infrastructure has been central to our project. And one of the things we've learned is that collaboration is, uh, you need this light structure, but also one of the ways to theory in ethnography is in turning our findings back into questions. One of the things that we've learned working across uh, different research communities is that We've, we've, many of the things that are tacit in our practice, we've had to, in their terms, expose. And if you, and if you, when you expose something, you render it explicit, there's always kind of danger in that explicitness, which again, I think that we uh, resist with good reason, but we can't resist and support it. Uh, we can't collaborate, 
right, and support it technically without those exposures. So we use this kind of image to say, how do you create enough structure to bring people into a shared conversation without over-determining what happens in that space? OK, so with um, this kind of imagination in mind, I want to return to my um, shale rock formation uh, and, and look at the, and, and uh, bring your attention to the effort to, to to watch the interaction of these, uh, th these scales of work, uh, really paying attention to the way data infrastructure and data imaginaries uh, animate the whole. I think th another thing that we do as practice is we don't, even, we don't just want to understand the way the complex system is animated, but the drivers, many determinations of that system. Capitalism is certain, certainly a driver, modes of ex uh, entrenched modes of expertise, uh, historical imaginations. And one way I think about what we're after is we don't want a, re a re simple reproduction of the current regime. We want to kind of offset it and one-off one it. And in this, I'm very much, uh, uh, it, it stayed with me, a, a line by Le Leotard talking about the 20th century saying, we've done enough of that, just something different. So there is a privileging of difference uh, rather than the reproduction of the same, and that I'll, what I'll point to. So, so what I'm going to do now is try and run through very, very quickly the presentations that Craig has pulled together for us in this workshop, um, knowing in advance that I'll, in, I'll do uh, injustice to them, uh, but trying to get all of you to see them as part of a set uh, and to pull them into shared questions. And I, uh, I do, do, I'll do injustice both with words and images. Um, and, uh, and I hope you'll take that um, provocatively rather than reductively. OK, so uh, Craig has pulled us together to ask us to think about the challenges, social, theoretical, empirical, and material of the, infra of the Anthropocene and its infrastructures uh, and infrastructural challenges. So Bruce Braun and Stephanie Wakefield point to plans and imaginations for what some call soft engineering on the shorelines of New York using artificial oyster reefs. Called out by a design competition hosted by HUD, I, I notice, which is an organization in my world, implicating how security is imagined, implemented, and organized. And again, at risk of being overly brief, I want you to, to talk about, to, to pull all of these together. Um, this is an image I found of, uh, uh, of, of a New York City pr pr uh, protected with uh, soft engineering infrastructure. Natasha Myers draws out different imaginings of the way plants can sustain our world, contrasting the glass mo house model that Singapore has built with the more grounded model of Viennese artist Louis uh, Weinberger. Gaston Gordillo uh, also points to the immobilizing affects and effects in the stunning disregard the makers of rubble in the Argentine Chaco have for the people they have plowed under. Uh, this, rather than an image of the rubble itself, is of the global flows uh, that animate that rubble, as was drawn out in our discussion. Uh, Shayla uh, Mulhmain describes the transformation of the Sonoran desert landscape through the tangled force of climate change, fishing bans on the Colorado River, and Mexico's war on drugs. This is an Erling Landsat satellite image of the Sonoran Desert. I'm not sure if it's from the same region that Shayla works in. I point to it because, again, Landsat Earth observing data became available to the scientific community and to the public you know, in a very specific time frame. This is from around 2000. And so this kind of way in seeing in the world has kind of historical specificity. Um, Casper Braun Jensen and Arturo Morita draw us into the conundrums of energy development in Cambodia, pointing to different energy imaginaries, questioning the genealogies within which anthropologists have or oriented their work since at least the 1940s questioning that because of the question of this gives us any traction in being involved in these developments. So this is not a solarizing project that Casper um, and Arturo speak about, but points to the kind of 
um, energy alternatives that he's documenting as an ethnographer. Andrea Ballesteros' paper on the way civic scientists and engineers imagine and thus care for the underground water in northwestern Costa Rica reminds us of how the trope of functionalism works in their work and in ours. Again, another Landstat uh, Earth observing image. Nikhil Anand describes the terrific challenge of knowing and caring for the network of pipes that supply water throughout Mumbai and other cities of the world, noting that it is not only cities in the global south that have extreme to the point of absurd leakage problems. He starts his paper, for example, with a truly unnerving description of workers submerged for weeks beneath New York City, clawing at concrete to expose and deal with the leaks there. And this image uh, I came across just kind of Googling around um, of a, and it's uh, about a software package that became available in, um, in the late, I think this was in around 2006, uh, that became available to, um, to city officials in Mumbai dealing with leakages there. Austin Ziderman provides a sad account of an already marginal community in the Colombian port city of Buenaventura facing further peril through a wicked nexus of climate change, Dubai-owned port expansion, and criminal gangs. And one thing I put, this is a very simple map uh, of the port, uh, and it brought to mind for me the years that I was on the ground in Bhopal, there was no aerial map of the city, so I carried around these little hand-produced drawings. So the way that, and I, I don't know how available those, uh, those kinds of visuals are in Buenaventura, but again, I mean, the, the historical specificity of these kind of ways of seeing. And then Antina van Schnitzler's piece on infrastructure after apartheid draws out the deeply uneven and enduring inequalities in, in access to infrastructure. She focuses particularly on to toilets and sanitary infrastructure. And this image um, uh, adds a layer to the absurdity. It's actually off a website for a Chinese company encouraging development in uh, infrastructure in Africa. So again, there's a lot of oil in the mix of our understanding. Then Ashley Cars asked us to consider how boundaries between infrastructure and that which isn't structured are made and operate affectively as well as logistically in liminal zones around the Panama Canal. And I'll point here to this image I found of the Panama Canal ex expansion. The kind of liminal spaces that Ashley uh, focuses on aren't visible here. And this is a real problem with a lot of the new informatics-driven uh, visualizations, is they bring many things into view and cut many things out of view. And I'll uh, point you to the work of Sarah Wiley, an anthropologist, um, or an STS, an anthropologist scholar educated at MIT, who writes powerfully of the way Schlumberger's ability to see the underground has driven their ability to go after shale gas oil but in the visualizations, everyday Schlumberger engineers see there literally is no surface and, no, and thus no effects. And Joe Masco points to what I would call the discursive risk in idioms of crisis, the way talk of crisis, whether about nuclear militarization or climate change, has immobilized us, offsetting alternative futures. So with those just kind of examples in mind, I'm going to um, Return to questions which, um, let me just, and what I've done is ask myself what kind of shared questions these papers um, bring out for us. And so, you, can you read this? Probably not. Okay, so I'll, let me start at the top. Um, so, in the very top layer, the ge geopolitical. One of the things that I noted um, earlier to Craig is wither the Anthropocene. Across our papers today, there's almost no attention to the actual uh, biochemical, physical operations of the Anthropocene, and particularly whether in extreme weather, in changing growing conditions. I mean, it's out there, but we, as Craig pointed out at the beginning, I think we're hesitant to, to give it a name and call it out. On the meta level, um, and I, I pulled this question from the work of Joe, Natasha, and Gus Joan. What are the idioms through which contemporary problems enduring and emergent are addressed? 
and Joe, for example, points us to the idiom of crisis. What problems center these idioms, and what kinds of disregard do they license? What isn't problematized? At the macro level, the traditional level of kind of law and politics, uh, from Austin and Shayla's work, what political economic determinations are producing reward, risk, and injury in the contemporary period? What operates as engines of growth, wealth, and poverty? Ports, for example, uh, operated as real engines, uh, as do Dubai conglomerates across these papers. Uh, fishing bans designed to protect ecosystems, for example, agribusiness in Argentina feeding China's pigs. Uh, at the mezzo level, uh, <coughs> whether the organizational form, function, and dysfunction. There's almost no level, meso-level analysis uh, in the papers that we talked about today. That's, that's pretty usual for us as anthropologists. Um, and yet, in an infrastructural moment, the, uh, the questions about how we organize productivity um, are clearly uh, important. Uh, at the micro level, uh, the level of practice, Again, pretty minimally at attended to. Um, and again, I'm not asking for papers to do everything. I'm asking kind of, if we draw these together, what systems come into view and what, uh, what do not. At what I've called the uh, uh, EDSCO level, which is the level of expertise in education, I think that's well addressed in Bruce's paper, uh, Casper's, Andrea's, and Natasha's. What infrastructural imaginaries are in play what genealogies shape them, and what futures do they interiorize. Natasha draws this out really crisply in her comparison um, of uh, uh, different ways of thinking about gardens and enclosed spaces. What, effic what efficiencies and functions they assume to be possible and valuable. The nano level, the level of seg uh, subject formation, is really the, uh, as in my reading, the kind of the the, the level at which Ashley Karsh focuses, asking how are infrastructure, technical, ecological, social, and conceptual, read, related to, or not, cared for, governed, and alienated? What subjects, of the, um, of the, uh, what s subjects are produced by infrastructure? Uh, what do they sustain, and what do they care about? And then at the technical level, which I read is the primary level of analysis for uh, Anon and, Ash and also Ashley. What is the character of nested technical systems? What fields of antagonism do they function in or dysfunction within? What labor do they perform? And what risk and injury do they produce? And I'll, I'll jump ahead to the eco level. And I think that if we think of the ecological level in similar terms as, si as operating in a field of antagonism, Gaston's paper on the forest clearly shows this, that forests aren't just forests, but are in a kind of field of, of antagonistic forces. It gives us analytic purchase, I think, that can move us into politics. Um, and importantly, um, as Ashley pointed out today, how do the remains of the forest haunt us? How do the remains of ecosystems that aren't here you know, continue to inhabit the presence? And then last, at the data levels, <laughs> What data infrastructures have been built and sustained in different domains, and to what effect, affect and effect? What data infrastructures have enabled recognition and engagement with contemporary problems? What data imaginaries and, and desires are in play in different domains? And I just want to end by saying that I think in attending to the level of data infrastructure and, and data imaginaries, not only do we bring, do we view how systems are produced and sustained in the world, but it allows us to place, to live within, within those systems and participate in what they become. And, I, and so I want to end with this uh, image of the kaleidoscope as I think as hermeneutic scholars involved in the, uh, in the analysis of infrastructure, we can uh, provide different kind of angles on the same problem that many other forms of expertise are attending to as well. And the reason to do that is that any one form of expertise inevitably lies. Um, it inevitably, we know that in the very bringing to focus, we create marginality. And so this, I think, is the call to collaboration among ourselves and also between us and people in other fields of expertise. Um, 
And so it is through collaboration, I think, that there, we have any chance of what I think of as offset futures. And so bringing our work together in new ways, being able to articulate it in ways that move across our projects, but also between our projects into other fields of knowledge production, uh, I think is a key challenge. And, and playing um, with data analytics, I think, is one place to work. Thank you.